In regard to your article about uh, Malthus and Bozera, a dynamic synthesis, can you recall how you first got the idea to combine the population dynamic of Malthus and the technology dynamic of Bozera as dimensions of a phase space, as it appears in your article? I've been teaching both Malthus and Bozera for a number of years, and I gradually came to think they were quite consistent and tried fiddling around with mathematical uh, equations of the sort here in that article. Um, I've also been working on a completely different project on the Easterlin hypothesis and the using phase space diagrams to show the relationship of, uh, say, current births to past births, something like that. Uh, and I also was taking a course in what's it called bioeconomics on the mathematics of uh, fisheries and forestry and so on. It involved a lot of dynamic uh, modeling. Somehow these three different things came together and a light bulb <laughs> went on in my mind. Did you, have the, did you develop the, the equations that describe the dynamics of Malthus model and of, as a Bozo model separately before they came together? Were they pretty well developed independently? Certainly Malthus I developed separately, because that's what I worked on in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. um, and the Malthus, the Bozerup came later, and I guess as I tried to formalize the Bozerup idea, then I saw that really it was perfectly consistent, mm -hmm. and then I sort of grafted it on to what okay, so the Bozerup for the Malthus. part of the model grew on to the Malthus. Yeah, part. that's right. All right. Um, what sorts of discussions with students or colleagues contributed to the development of the details in this theoretical model? I'd say mostly it was just sort of solo mm -hmm. thinking. Um, and to the extent that I had useful conversations on this, it was almost entirely with graduate students, really. In seminars or independently? No, uh, sort of, yeah, maybe a bit in seminars, but more sort of one-on-one. -on -one. I'd get excited about this, I'd go talk to, there were a couple of people who were sort of on the same wavelength. And, mm -hmm. uh, talk to them and they get upset and say, no, that couldn't be so, and how about this, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, what I can't remember is where, you know, how I came to realize the role of these equilibrium lines and uh, so on, which was really a sort of key notion mm -hmm. in, in getting it down. Um, I, I, what I, I had some earlier versions of this paper. I did a paper at the PAA, uh, which was not nearly so well developed as that article uh, that was, when was that? published. It was maybe 85 or 84, possibly 86, something like that. So it wasn't very long before this. It wasn't very long before, but that had a completely open poser of space. So it didn't, I wasn't thinking in terms of these spaces and these sort of circles in the, the little circles. space and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and I finally got that sort of clear in my mind for a uh, conference in England at Cambridge, mm -hmm. uh, run by Roger Schofield and David Coleman. Well, that's the conference that Which led to that publication. Book, you know, yeah. So it was really in the course of trying to think it through for that. And I had some time. I had a Guggenheim, but I put a lot of time, a lot of thought into that article. Um, and I think I, in fact, I wish I had written more about it, and I may go back to it. But my, my fundamental long-run interest was in this question of human population equilibrium with mm -hmm. environment and technology and structure and that sort of thing. And I thought of this Bozerup idea as something that I had to come to terms with to be able to complete my thinking in that other project. And I still want to do a book that sort of puts together the work I've, I've done or that would be this equilibrium notion, and then this would be the Malthus Bozerup would be one um, mm -hmm. development uh, of the, the main stock of the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's clear that the that the Malthus uh, dimension of that space has a kind has a self equilibrating mechanism around that Malthus line. Yeah, that's clear. But do, do you see your conception of the of the equilibrium? in Bozerup's dynamic 
as something that you have added to Bozerup's ideas or that you think is there in Bozerup's ideas? Does she have an equilibrium point in her theories where societies stabilize? I think there are a number of things that I've, I've added or mm -hmm. perhaps I should say strong assumptions uh, made out of. No, I did. Bozerup was at this conference mm -hmm. in England and she seemed to like the article, but I'm not sure that she, I know math, mathematics and diagrams aren't her natural mode of expression, and I'm not sure she, uh, what should I say, I'm not sure we were communicating completely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think that idea of a sort of equilibrium state of technology is probably something that I added, or at least put much more the, definitely. The closing of the Bozer of space from above, making yeah. it into a, a circle. Yeah. yeah. I want to go, go back one uh, second to uh, the development of the ideas, because at one point David Weir, who's an economic demographer, an economic historian, said to me when I was working on this stuff, because it, lo it looks like it's Malthusian at the beginning and at the end, and it's all Bozer in between or something like that. And I found that a helpful <laughs> Comment, and of course, that also relates to this idea of closing of the Bozer of space, mm -hmm. because it's the closing of the Bozer of space that makes it end up being Malthusian as well as starting out mm -hmm. uh, Malthusian and gets a sort of global yeah. upper equilibrium. Well, I suppose it would be easy to say that uh, either events or intellectual fashions and concerns of the last few years uh, lend some support to this idea that there is some upper boundary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it may... I Whether or not it was in Bozerup's theory to begin yeah. with, yeah. either way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's not going to... It wouldn't be that we reach a point and there's no further change. I'm sure there would be change, but the pace of change would be much slower. The, uh, the nature of change would be different. It might more change in composition, uh, uh, things like that. I think also, uh, probably the most controversial, you, you can get that idea, of course, from a sort of environmental, uh, ecological perspective. I think the more controversial and stranger idea to people is that there's a, a sort of intellectual overhead cost and a social overhead mm -hmm. cost in sort of maintaining the stock of ideas and knowledge and understanding, and that that imposes a kind of limit. And there's a limit to uh, lifespan example, and you can't go beyond a hundred years of education at mm -hmm. some point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's some optimal amount of time to spend absorbing uh, what's known from the past. Yeah, the intensity start. of that process limits how much you can get in there. Yeah, yeah so that's one, one thing. And uh, the idea of a small country like Norway that inherited the entire stock of of knowledge from the world up to that point, trying to maintain that by themselves, not make it grow or anything, just to be able to use it. I think, to me at least, I and mean, it's not really empirics, it's introspection, but to me, brings home the idea that it's not just whether those ideas exist and whether the, the file cabinets and blueprints exist, but it's also the degree of specialization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is this reminds me of a of a comment that that uh, Kingsley Davis made some years ago when somebody asked him what would be the optimum size for a space colony. He said five million. <laughs> that's to be at least five million because they have to have division of labor and they yeah. have to be able to specialize and pass down the technology and that sort of thing. So it's a similar kind of idea. Yeah. Um, how do you feel today about whether that last bozer up space in the figures for industrial society should be bounded or open above? Do you think there is a, a ceiling uh, on our carrying capacity, our cultural carrying capacity, too? Yeah, I do. Okay, I do. so the top one is still closed. Yeah, in my mind it's still closed. Um, which is not to say I think we're right there now or anything like mm -hmm. that. I don't really... Somewhere in uh, the circle. No, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. We hope we're still within the circle. Yes, well, we'll come back to it if we, if we are, right? Um, the one other thing which sometimes causes confusion for some people, in my experience, is the, is the auxiliary lines that appear 
in the, in the last of your diagrams in that article. There's the Malthus line running through the middle of the Bozrop spaces, yeah. and then there are some other lines for China, for Africa, oh, yeah. which, yeah, which, yeah. which don't lead into the next circle. If you extrapolate them, they go yeah. off somewhere else, and so they yeah. prove to be dead ends. Yeah. Are those also Malthus lines? How would you characterize those little lines? Yes. Now, you're stretching the limits of my recollection. Okay. But, uh, but I think I, I, I do remember just what I had in mind. Yes, those are Malthus lines, and they would refer to one of two things. Uh, First of all, say take the case of Africa. Uh, it might it might be, and I, uh, I'm not really sure how, how how plausible this is, but it might be that say soil climate conditions um, mean that given certain kinds of technology, uh, suppose you have access to agricultural settled agricultural technology, you still can't get up to very substantial densities. And so it might be that the kind of equilibrium which uh, the population would go, even under an agricultural regime, uh, would be at a relatively low density. Shift it off to and the it left. might be, yeah, off to the left. And it might be then that within the Bozer of space, that's going to lead to uh, a sort of technological and demographic equilibrium uh, at a low enough density so that it's quite difficult to, you're quite distant from the densities needed to sustain an industrial. Now, uh, of course, Australia or lots of low, low density populations, you'd have to, you can't take that all too literally. You have to mm -hmm. uh, uh, think about their integration in the international community and all that. And as for China, I was here you know, trying to capture something that, uh, that Bozerup suggests. I'm not sure they're reading too much into what he suggests or not, but it, the question is why didn't why isn't China the technological leader of the world today instead of Europe? And Bozer and, and other people have suggested that one possible reason is that uh, the population might have been too dense, might have become too dense back, say, in the 15th century. Or something like that. Uh, Malthus, after all, had the idea that the, the population density and the standard of living depended on reproductive institutions, and he had this idea that. China and Asia, I don't know what he knew about it, uh, but that uh, the reproductive institutions were such that there would be very little disincentive to marry early and the fertility would be high, and so that you'd reach a very high density and impoverished equilibrium. Um, now, so the idea there is that the Bozer line might, that the, the Malthus line might intersect the Bozer line at a point too far to the right, at too high a density. Why should that be a disadvantage? Well, the disadvantage is that then. Uh, there's very little surplus in the equilibrium population, mm -hmm. and so the possibility of culling that surplus, taxing it or gathering it somehow, and using it to uh, develop technology, develop an agricultural sector, and so on, would be more limited. And Bozer has a way of making that story very concrete, and that is to talk about the uh, use, well, as the population gets denser, you go to, from, say, one crop a year to two or three crops a year, and as you do that, the off-season leisure of peasants uh, disappears, and it may be exactly that off-season leisure that is the surplus that is uh, sort of harvested by the central government and used to build roads and irrigation mm -hmm. and big uh, sort of collective projects. And when the population, if the population settles at a density too, it's too great, that leisure is used up to just produce food to feed the population. And that would be kind of a demographic explanation for Marx's oriental modes of production, in a way. Uh, what was Marx's oriental the, mode of the, production? The, the state does not have a big enough, powerful enough centralized apparatus that it can that it can extract much so-called surplus uh -huh, from yes, the population. Okay. Uh, yeah. Controversial idea that the, the Russians have banned from their literature for a while. They, they don't want anybody talking about the power of the state. <laughs> state surpluses. Yeah. Um, one, one question that, that uh, has been asked in discussions that I've been in with this article is the possibility of another Bozerup space above our own. 
and whether we are actually on the line for it or whether we represent another displaced Malthus line which will not lead to the next Bozer of space. Do you have any speculation about that? No, it's an interesting uh, question. People haven't been very good at predicting that sort of thing. Um, what do you see signs now in our technology of a next, uh, I don't know what it would be, a computer age or something of the sort that would? It's, one, one student suggested that possibly our uh, environmental inefficiencies in American society are a similar sort of displacing mechanism like the soil conditions in Africa yeah. or the population yeah. dynamics of China so that it's pushing us and our version of the Malthus line off into one corner of our Bozer of space so that we yeah. won't be on track for the next circle, whatever it is. That's a very interesting very clever student. Um, but that would get, I mean, you might say that's a global problem and not less just a mm -hmm. national one. In fact, as, as time other. goes on, the whole model presumably refers to a larger and larger mm -hmm. unit that maybe by now is practically the whole, whole globe. But that, it seems to me that gets to the issue of externalities to, to childbearing and to what extent individual parents or even nations are internalizing the mm -hmm. costs of uh, environmental consequences of a birth. And well, it may be that uh, there will be some sort of correction uh, in the next 10 or 20 years. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, there are all kinds of proposals that have come up. Uh, who knows? Um, anyway, I think that's a very interesting idea the idea that these uh, environmental externalities essentially mean that, well, I would take, I interpret that to mean we're headed towards a Chinese outcome, say, where we're really at a denser, mm -hmm. headed for a denser population, may not seem that, that dense in a place like the United States, but that uh, in terms of the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb uh, dioxide or whatever. And it's not so much that we're accelerating the population dimension, but we're shifting to the right by decelerating the, the uh, technological capacities. But that will also shift you to the right. Ah. Uh. You, if you handicap yourself technologically. No, but I'm not sure I know. I mean, if we were... Well, this was not a very you know, fully developed discussion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what I'm trying to think is, if we were, if, suppose we were suddenly to take into account the environmental costs of our activities, then... Oh, well, to correct it. Yeah, uh, I mean, then a lot of our technologies would have to, uh, to change and become much less efficient in the terms in which we're custom to, to measure now, but, well, anyway, I think it's an interesting it's idea. food for thought, anyway. Food for thought, yeah. We'll see where these models go in the future. Thank you for your time.